Let's begin our webcast today by talking about pile characteristics for effective animal mortality management. So let's start out by looking at some of the slides here that clearly show that just because you have a, a bunch of dead animals scattered all over the place behind some wooded area out of sight does not mean that this is a uh, environmentally sound way of uh, disposal or utilization of uh, uh, animal carcasses. Um, this is also illegal as well as we know that it is environmentally uh, wrong. Uh, it, 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 it may contribute to soil pollution, water pollution, and even uh, emissions, some of the gaseous emissions from these carcasses may pollute our air and vegetation itself. And then, just because we have a pile rather than scattered dead cattle does not mean that it is a compost pile. Once again, you are looking at a violation as well as uh, contributing potentially to poor air quality, water quality, soil pollution, as well as vegetation pollution. So let's uh, talk about a proper compost pile. Now this is one of the uh, static compost pile, and as you can see how the feedstock that is completely enveloping or blanketing the dead animal is uh, topped off by cascading the feedstock. So making sure that we have fair amount of uh, air spaces and, and fair amount of uh, fluffiness on top of that uh, animal from the feedstock pile itself. So this is what a static pile would like, look like. And then if we have a series of those piles uh, with several uh, animals under, underneath, completely covered by the feedstock, uh, that's where we will call those windrows, such as the ones shown on this slide, where we have four uh, different windrows. Okay, uh, so pile structure and composition. We know that a, a pile, compost pile will be a, a mixture of three different things. It will be solids, there will be moisture, and then we'll have gases or air. Solids, as we know, will be of varying part, particle sizes, and they will have different geometry and different shapes. And then also, depending on what the feedstock is, there will be a varying chemical composition in terms of carbon, nitrogen, and some other macro and micronutrients. The voids may be filled with air only or gases. They may be filled completely with water, or they may be partially filled with water or air. What about the carcass itself? You're looking at a carcass that is relatively lower in carbon to nitrogen ratio as compared to the feedstock or the co-composting material that you're going to compost this uh, animal, uh, uh, the carcass with. The, uh, the porosity of that carcass, if it is completely intact, is going to be fairly low and it will have fairly high amount of liquid or moisture still in it, depending upon the condition of that carcass. So what about the, 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 the composting feedstock? We generally recommend that we have a composting feedstock, which is obviously composed of plant and animal-based uh, materials, having a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 35. And then we may at times require or need some bulking agent, which is generally a plant-based material. And that bulking agent is primarily for the structural strength and bulking and drying of some of the wetter piles that we may face while we are doing this animal mortality, mortality composting. And then there are some instances where we want to make sure that there are no odors. There are minimum odors, I should say. And then we have uh, drying material of some wetter piles. And that's where a biofilter or some carbon-rich plant-based material comes into play. So it, it will also shed moisture and then by reducing odors, controlling odors, hopefully will also control the, attra the attraction of the predators to that pile. 
Of course, shape and dimensions are important. Uh, a manageable height will be five to seven feet or so. And then uh, the top of that pile could be pointed in areas where you have excessive moisture. Uh, and it could be flat or even slightly concave in very dry climates where you may actually want to gather some moisture on top of that pile so that it can seep in and provide the much needed moisture to the microorganisms. And then when you look at the sides, uh, they're generally sloped uh, to shed the water again. So here's uh, just a schematic or the cutout of a uh, compost pile and it shows various components that I just spoke of. So what we have is inside here uh, a couple of dead carcasses, masses here that are completely blanketed by a uh, organic material that has some manure in it to introduce uh, ubiquitous amounts of uh, microorganism that will decompose these uh, carcasses. Then we also have a uh, bulking agent, uh, for example, wood chips uh, that would provide the structural stability to these uh, carcasses that may be very heavy in some instances. And so that's where we may actually need a, a, a bulking agent that could just be uh, plant-based or may have a, a mixture of plant-based and, and animal manure. And then, of course, another very important component of this pile will be a liner. And to create that impervious layer so we don't have the, any leachate or any other materials that may be harmful to the groundwater leaching out of the carcass and getting into, into the soil or the groundwater eventually. And of course, we are also looking at this uh, biofilter uh, that could be uh, of sawdust or could be uh, cotton gin trash, for example. Again, the idea is to reduce odors and also if the pile is too wet, uh, hopefully uh, dry the outer surfaces of that pile. All right, so uh, let's look at the effect of pile physical properties. So the first thing that comes to mind will be the moisture of that pile, pile of the water. Generally recommended to be between 50 and 60 percent. And why it is needed? Of course, we need this moisture so we can transport the nutrients in that, in that pile, the carbon, the nitrogen, and other nutrients to the uh, microbes. Uh, but what happens when you have excessive moisture in the pores, they reduce that oxygen diffusion and transfer, and then they can then inhibit or impede the aerobic composting activity because these microbes do require the oxygen to be able to uh, then do their job of biodegrading the mass. Uh, and then uh, we also have some fibers or bulky materials such as wood shavings and straw that absorb more moisture but maintain the structure, as I mentioned, the bulking materials earlier. Uh, and then if we have materials that are sludge and grass clippings, they, uh, under many instances, may actually compact or settle under the weight of larger carcasses, and they can further reduce the porosity of that pile. And we will discuss that in the next few slides. So just to give you an example of different feedstocks, if you look at the maximum recommended moisture content, uh, you will see that theoretically if that is 100%, as you move from straw, wood, and rice hulls all the way down to some of the wet wastes, you have restrictions on as to how much really the maximum moisture content you can use. And that is again primarily due to the inherent uh, physical properties of those uh, feedstocks. Uh, so let me just give you one example here. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a newly built uh, dairy manure compost. So this line, uh, on the left side you have uh, the y-axis, the temperature, and on the x-axis you have uh, the uh, the, uh, the time, when you started out the composting of this dairy manure at about 60% uh, moisture, within hours you reached the uh, temperatures of above 170 degrees and, and maintained those temperatures throughout 
to the six days of observations. However, when you, uh, uh, when you were starting out with a dairy manure compost at about 66% moisture, you could barely reach uh, 130, 135 degrees in three days, and then they had to take the material out of the container, add some more dry material to bring the moisture content down to 61% for this feedstock, and then within hours, we reached those higher temperatures that are desired and they lasted for the next three or four days of the experiment. Uh, let's look at the effect of pile physical properties in terms of the porosity in free airspace. We know that porosity is uh, the volume of voids divided by the total volume of that pile, and then free, free airspace will be the gas volume uh, divided by the total volume. And then, of course, uh, there, is, there, is a, there has to be a balance between total porosity and free airspace, and I'll discuss that in the next couple of slides. All right. So, <clears throat> the, uh, if, if you look at this, this new graph here, uh, on the y-axis you have moisture content, and, and at the bottom uh, x-axis you have the free airspace in percent. And, and I'm showing you several different graphs or, or linear lines of different potential co-composting materials. And you can see that as long as you are within this narrow range of 30 to 35 percent free airspace, you will hit the optimum moisture content for a given feedstock. And the second observation will be that uh, there are certain feedstocks where the, we have little more freedom to go with a higher moisture content as a co-composting material, for example, mixed refuse, garbage. But compared to that, we may have to remain below 55% or so for uh, some of the feedstocks such as sludge and garbage mix or beef feedlot manure. Uh, here's another example of the effect of moisture content and free space on how the oxygen is being consumed by the microorganisms. So there are a couple of observations here. Again, on the y-axis, what you have is a uh, oxygen consumption rate by the microorganisms. Uh, and then on the, on the x-axis, you have two scales. The, the top scale is the moisture content in percent, and the bottom scale is the free airspace. The first thing that we need to notice here is in these three curves is that we started out, if we start out with the fresh mixed refuse composting, uh, we will have, we will consume uh, the most oxygen uh, by the fresh uh, refuse. Uh, and, and the microorganisms organisms will consume the most oxygen uh, when it started out. And as the time passed, after five days or ten days, the overall oxygen consumption rate also uh, reduced considerably. The second thing that is most important is that if you look at the optimum uh, oxygen consumption rate, right about 90% or so, in all cases, for example, here at the fresh mixed refuse or all the way at the bottom at the 10-day-old mixed refuse, as long as we maintain the temperature of about 67%, we were able to consume about 90% of the oxygen. So that really emphasizes upon the importance of maintaining that free airspace in a compost pile. Okay, so very quickly I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, case studies where we had a, a, a good compost pile and, and another case where we did not have a, a very good compost pile and, and what happened. So we'll start out by this one compost pile. Uh, in this case, we had a 1,300-pound cow uh, mortality and the compost material, the feedstock, was fresh and composted manure solids. Uh, that were uh, gathered from this uh, mechanical, mechanically uh, separated solids pile, as you can see right here. 
the carbon to nitrogen ratio was 20, uh, low in this case, and the moisture content was just about uh, right in this case, uh, in, ca in case for the separated cow manure solids. However, when we started taking our temperature measurements using data loggers, we had uh, temperature measurements right above the cow and then right below the cow. Uh, and then this red line is the line that is at 131 degrees Fahrenheit temperature. That is the required temperature uh, for several days, uh, depending on the, the conditions uh, for the most of the compost to have uh, uh, less viable weed seeds, also reduction of most of the pathogenic type uh, uh, materials in that, in that composting pile. But you can see that this, this uh, we took temperatures for about three months, and right green right here is the ambient temperature. Uh, within a few days, we really uh, came down to about 120 uh, to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit in both cases, and within about a month and a half, both temperatures were similar and almost approaching close to the ambient temperatures in about three months. Nothing was turned in this case. So after three months, we uh, came to inspect the pile, and we were hopeful because just looking at this, uh, we thought that uh, the compost was, uh, the pile was working properly, and it was doing the, the biodegradation that is desired for this very large animal. However, when we further opened the pile, it was not in a very good shape. We still had lots of the contents of the rumen in there. We had bones that were not even beginning to disintegrate, and so the situation uh, did not look very, very good in this, in this case, and we had to, of course, add more dry material and then reconstruct the pile and let it go for about six months before we got the desired results. On the other hand, we had another mortality. In this case, it was a much bigger cow. Uh, it was a nearly 2,000-pound cow. And uh, in this case, uh, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of this feedstock, which was uh, basically wood chips, uh, wood shavings, and horse manure, uh, spent horse bedding, uh, was 49, a little bit higher uh, than, than what we recommend. And the moisture content was borderline, uh, about 41.4% in this case. So we basically uh, created a base of the substrate, which was about 18 inches average depth. And then we lay the cow on top, and then we completely covered it with the same uh, spent horse bedding material. Here's uh, just a, a depiction of the average substrate depth that we have before we laid the, the carcass on it. So in this case, again, if you look at the pile and ambient temperatures, we were able to measure uh, the bottom of the pile temperatures and the top of the, uh, uh, above the uh, cow temperatures, and then of course the ambient temperatures. Uh, this was, uh, this experiment was, uh, demonstration was done in a very dry area of Texas, but we were fortunate that we were able to get uh, the right uh, range at the, at the right time. But the, the most important thing to consider here is that look at the temperatures. This is the 131 degree Fahrenheit line, and for several days and weeks, we were able to maintain those pile temperatures above the 131 degree Fahrenheit. And then also there were some impacts when we had some rain, we were able to increase the temperature a little bit and in some instances, uh, we were able to maintain this for a weeks upon end uh, above the 131 degrees Fahrenheit. So then we started uh, out to inspect the contents of that pile, and the next slide shows that. So here's what, the, the, uh, from looking from a distance, the contents of the pile looked like. Some of that was still warm and still steaming in October. Uh, the, the conditions of the bones, they were fairly disintegrated and hollowed out, very easy to crush. Same thing with the skull. Uh, you could crush it right under your foot, and most of the cow 
that 2,000 pound cow was not to be seen after about six months of higher temperatures and a good composting pile. Here's another view of those two temperatures. Uh, you can see where we had the successful uh, run. We had temperatures that were sustained from both bottom and top and above 131 degrees Fahrenheit and where we did not have a successful run, we were not able to maintain those temperatures above 131 degrees past uh, a few days and weeks. All right, to wrap this up, in summary, uh, pile feedstock, moisture, porosity, and airspace absolutely impact the outcome of a composting carcass. Uh, we should try to start a pile with a carbon to nitrogen ratio of at least more than 25, and 35 is probably even better. And of course, uh, if we're working with most of the kinds of uh, uh, plant and, and, and animal organic materials, uh, we should try to maintain those moistures, initial moistures at 50 to 60 percent, but never uh, go less than 40 percent to, to dry it out too much. And then, of course, using bulking and biofilter materials, if and when we need, should be recommended. And then we should select proper feedstock to maintain about a 30 to 40 percent airspace. And carcass composting requires a common sense and a common approach. And with that, I want to thank you, and I want to uh, tell you that happy composting. <laughs>